Hello and welcome to everyone for the first session of 2023 and I hope that you are all fit and well and looking forward to learning lots of things that you may have thought you knew but you won't really have done so. Uh, today we have Carl Donabauer who as I think you may <laughs> know is an Access MVP, he's been an MVP for 24 years unbelievably which makes him somewhat of a child prodigy because he's not even 40 yet. Um, <laughs> he's based in Vienna and as you probably know, he organizes two major conferences each year, DevCon in English, AEK in German. And he also, as well as his Don Carl website, he has a new blog, Access Forever. I love the title. Also creates the Access News quarterly newsletter as a video. And the next one, I think Carl will be out sometime soon. You see the, the screen here, the, the, my green screen on the back, my studio here. We just did the first recording, so it will last some week until I can uh, publish it. Carl is going to whiz through somewhere between 12 and 15 brief tips and tricks and tools in about 60 minutes. Okay, Carl, are you ready to take over? I'm ready to go, yep. Yep. Welcome, Carl. Wonderful. So my name is Carl. That's the end of the introduction. I will not use any PowerPoints, I promise, <laughs> in this session. I use uh, Access's PowerPoint because Access can do anything. And so I'm just using this one here. And it contains all the things that I show you, uh, except for some EXEs, et cetera, but all the code, all the tips, all the links, and you get it after the session. So you don't have to ask this again, you get everything afterwards. And I just open it up. So this is an ActiB, an ACCDP with, I prepared 15 tips with about 50 minutes of duration, I think, depends on your questions. And I just start over with the first one. It's about generating test data. I know there, ex, there are websites that where you can generate test data, but they all have their restrictions. The, uh, there's nothing especially for access. Whereas this one here, advanced data generator, I could convince the, the author, Martin Donais from uh, the Netherlands to prepare a version just for access. And it's, it's a commercial tool for 99 euros but there is also a test and free version. And I'll actually, I have a license, but I, I have prepared this demonstration here with the free version. So uh, you'll see the limitations, etc. So uh, the tool is called Advanced Data Generator. I open it. And the first thing that you do here in order to generate this test data is to register databases. So oh, I, I don't want to register a new one. I uh, do not bore you with some typing, etc. Uh, you just say I register this database, and you get a file open dialog here to choose one, and then you say which driver you want to use. And the drivers are uh, OLEDB, the old one for MDPs, the new one for ACCDPs, and then you can test the connection. And if it's successful, you're done with the connection. That's it. And the free version, this test version is restricted to two connected databases, but you can always throw them away and register another one, et cetera. So it's not really very restrictive. The other thing, the next thing uh, that you do here is you create a project. Also prepared uh, two projects here, one for addresses, one for orders. And the first thing is that I will show you the test data ACCDB. It's, it just uh, contains three tables, addresses, orders, order details, and they are actually empty. So we start over with some addresses. There are just some of the usual fields, name, street, address, et cetera, an employee count, and the note so that we have some different types of data and fields, but it's empty. And this is the first one we will fill with the tool now. So I go back to the advanced data generator and I say, open up the addresses project. So uh, this is where I can choose which tables to fill. And I only choose one here, the tables, the table addresses. And it shows me all the fields that are in here. And I can now decide how to fill and with, with, uh, with what data I wanna fill the fields. And I just go quickly through this. First one is an address ID. I don't need any data because this is an auto number field. Second one would be the city, for example. And I did this here. Oh, let me choose the active zoom. 
I said, I want to have 10,000 rows. That's the standard number here, the default number. And I could say now that I want to include null records. So records without a value here. And then I have uh, several things here and I choose random values. I can choose from all these things here, templates, fixed values, take it from a file, etc. I will show you several examples of this, but mostly you work with random values here because you want to have test data that really is diverse in every record, etc. So the next one after city, yeah, city, I have to say, I took it from a data library and this comes with the tool. You can have uh, several thousand of cities, of street names, of first names, et cetera, et cetera, and also city names. And I told him to take city names that sound like city names in the United Kingdom. For the date of birth, for example, the next field here, I chose date range from 1950 to 2005. And it just does random values in this range of dates. For the employee count, I chose give me one to 2000 random values again. First name, there's again a data library for American male and female names that all comes with the tool. Same for last names, American, no UK, but I mean, they are not that different, are they? <laughs> and for the notes, this is a memo field type. And I said, give me random values, include 60% of nulls. So only 40% will be filled. And that's actually a small bug here because I did a prefix and the suffix that always disappears when you go in again. I will show you the prefix and suffix later. And I told him uh, the tool, I told it to give me one to two paragraphs of meaningless text. And for the streets, I chose different method. I said, I want to random values and here's a fixed thing. You can choose random addresses with street and number. And for the last one, the zip file, it's a template where you get uh, postcodes from the UK or look like postcodes from the UK. So now let's do it. We try to get 10,000 records and I execute it. It asks me, do you really want to execute it? And it does it. And it says 10,000 times, but we only get 5,000. That's the free version. It's up to 5,000 records. But the nice thing is you can repeat this. And with the second one, you have 10,000, you have 15,000, et cetera. So it's good if you need some thousand test data, you don't have to pay anything, but buy, buy some licenses. If you need 1 million, it's, it's not... So I'm using, and let's have a look into the database now. Is there something in? I hope so. If we open up the addresses, you see this as a result. I've got 5,001 records here, see it down below, and they are quite meaningful, I would say. You get the names that sound like real names. You get an address with a number. You get some kind of zip code, city, and you get the date of birth in my range of uh, 1950 to 2005 or so that I choose and an employee count between one and 2000. And you get this. Yeah, this was the prefix. Wonderful note. And in the end, I can see something. And yeah, I got two paragraphs of meaningless text, but a lot of text for a memo field here. And I had the, the prefix end of note. OK, so you'll see about 40 percent are filled here. That's the first one that I wanted to show you. It's rather quick, but the second one I want to show you is table orders. That's empty too, and table order details is empty. And that's the sort of, of related data that you usually have in the database. So if I go to the relationships, you see you have the usual relationship here between the two, the order IDs, the, the foreign key in the order details, and there's also referential integrity and cascade uh, update and delete. So we have to fill this in the right order and with related data. And the tool is able to do this. So now we are in an empty state and I close it and I go to the second here, project here, orders. And I have uh, the two tables, order and order details. Again, with 10,000 rows or 5,000 in this test version. And the client ID is a number between one and 10,000. The order date is a date range of 2020 to 23 that I choose here. The order ID is an auto number. And the order number is an interesting one because there are far more possibilities to generate data here. And for this, I choose to do a macro. You can do macros that do more complicated data generation. And if I go into the macro builder here, 
you can see that I first choose a constant value and I just uh, chose a prefix ORD for order. And after that, the sequential number of uh, five digits and just sequential numbering here. And this is the marker and this is the result. You can't read it like this, but for this, you have the, the macro editor. And then there is the table details, the related data. So it's again, an auto number here. There's something for the price, just random values for this 2.52399 euros. And for the product name, I did an interesting thing. I choose to take it from a file. I have created a file products text. It's just a simple text file. I can show it. Just that simple text file with a few products in and it, uh, randomly takes one of the products for the record. So you can bring in your own data and mix it up with anything else here. And for the quantity, I choose between one and 30. And the interesting part, of course, is the foreign key field, the order ID from the main table orders. And for this, I choose, there are different versions, different methods you can choose. I choose to take for each record in table orders, give me one to five rows in order details and foreign key here, the, 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 the master field is order ID that I want to have in my details. So let's start it and see if it works. Yep, it did some 10,000 records. Again, the limit of 5,001 record in the test version in the free one and uh, in two tables. That's why we get 10,002 here, this number of records. And if we go to the database, it should contain something in the table orders. And you see my prefix and my number here, it worked with a sequential number. And if I click on this, you see, I chose to get one to five records from for the other table. And you see for every record here, I have related data, but uh, only for about uh, record uh, thousand and something, because I only get 5,000 records in the, in the free version here. If you buy a license, of course, you can have millions of records. If you need them and it goes until 1671 of the order ID, but I mean, I get test data for more than 1500 records here, also in the details for free. So that's just a quick overview of the tools. There's much more, but you saw macros, you saw take it from a file, random values, included libraries, etc. So it's a great tool in my point of view. And you get the link here, you get the whole database. And as I said, the test version has two database projects and 5001 records as a limit, but I mean, if you do it four times, you have a 20,000 really good looking test records. That's something for free and purchase some license. This was the first tip. Is there any questions, Colin? Then interrupt me. Otherwise, I go to tip number two. Very useful. Thanks for showing that. You're welcome. So let me go to tip number two. That's uh, just a short one. You often will have the situation where you need some kind of default value in a form or you want to know what was the last record where the user worked in, what was the last user, what was the last value he worked with. And I just want to show very briefly that you can do this very well with create property. I mean, everybody knows create property, the DAO method here, but maybe you didn't use it so far for this kind of thing. And I'll show you an example here. I have example form with an unbound text field. It's just in the date format, but it's unbound. And this is the last uh, thing I changed here. If we change it to the actual year here, and let's say one, and what's today? It's four. No, oops, oops. And I close it and I go in again, and it just remembers the date that I used. So you could remember the user, the, the record, whatever. Actually, I also built it in, in this uh, PowerPoint form that I use here. And we are currently at record number two. If I close all my examples and I hope it up, opens up again and I open up again, yeah, it continues with record two. I did exactly the same here and I know the our property here, the great property knows how to take it, how to, to save it. Let me just have a quick look into the code. It's not that complicated. I just, after update of this date field, I uh, say, come on and build me, fill my property. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't exist already, create it, that's it. And in the unopen procedure, this is a lazy one-liner just to show that you can do it. I 
take the property out again and uh, write it in the wonderful field Mifu. That's it. So you get all the code. It's not that complicated. Just as a quick reminder that you can use uh, DAO properties for this on the form or on the report or whatever form usually. So that was the second tip. The third tip. Carl, just yep. before you go on, sorry, I was muted at the end of the first one by mistake. No questions on this second one there, although I was very impressed with how easy that was. There were a lot of questions in the first one there, most of which have been answered, but but Thomas asked if anyone had used chat GBT, which is the, the thing of the moment, to generate test data. Have you ever tried? No, not yet. Not me. I don't, I don't any... trust it. It knows everything about me. It, 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 <laughs> seems, it seems to be in every single forum at the moment. Anyway, you carry on and I'll shut yep. up. The third tip that I have prepared is a bit more complicated and not, not really complicated. It's about getting the exit code, the return value of programs, external programs that you have called. And I had several real practical uses for this. For example, I had a project where I had to send a lot of data to web servers and also get data from web servers. And I used an external tool called WinSCP. Many of you will know it. WinSCP is a very wonderful tool and you can direct it with command line and you can have an SFTP connection, for example. And after it closes, I can ask it if everything worked. If you get back an exit code of zero, that's the convention, then everything was okay. If you get back one, then something did go wrong. I mean, the connection was wrong, whatever, the server had a problem. And the second case I had is CRC16. That's a check code for files if, if they are valid, if they are okay when you send them around, etc. And from a, cl a client had already an exe that was exactly the right thing for his use. And again, it, when I got zero, I was happy, no error, the usual thing. And then we had several error codes in this exe file. And I had to check for this. So how do you check for an external exit code? That's nothing in access. It comes back from a program and I will show you how I do. There's an example. It's an old code from a German BB Classic website. You see it also, it's 32 bit, but you could easily change it or check it for 64 bit, but it's just a few lines of code, three API functions. And the essential thing is that you open a process here. It's called shell X, by the way, because with shell, that's not possible with the built-in shell. But if you use this one, it opens the process and essentially it loops through and then gets the exit code. Let's do an example here with shell X, quick example example only and I say I want to have the exit code of notepad. So it starts notepad down here and when I close notepad I get zero. Wow this was everything was okay. A strange thing by the way is if you do it with calc. Uh, I don't know why but it, it brings up the zero. Everything is okay immediately but usually you really get it when you exit the program. And it's really useful in some, it was really useful in some projects I had with clients. So this just as a quick tip, exit code from external programs. Maybe you can use it somehow. The fourth one, uh, something I invented. Actually, it was in a, in a project uh, I did together with Thomas Muller. We tried to replace the navigation pane uh, several years ago, and we were not really happy with, with the outcome and some flaws, etc. But uh, this is one thing I had to invent for this because we needed something for the objects inside of a database. And I called it the horizontal continuous form. Let me show you the example. This is data again from this test data table addresses that we did at the beginning. And it just shows a few names. And you see it, it first column here ends with R AL and the second one starts with AM, AN, etc. And I can use the arrow keys to navigate through this as if it were just everything inside one form or so. And I show you what's behind that. It's four subforms, four instances of every time the, the same subform. And yeah, and I do some code to fill it. The code looks like this. The essential part is this SQL here. And I did a debug print. Oh, one moment, I'll show you another feature here. I forgot about the rows, I can tell I only want to see one, so you really have it horizontal or you want to do 20, etc. So it's really adjustable. And now we see more in the here in the code window. 
And the essential thing is 10 example here. I take the top 10, but I exclude everything that I already had before. That's the trick. So it's not rocket science. I just say, where is it? There should be somewhere an outer join here. It's too long. Left join, yeah? It's a left join here that says, well, the top 20 don't interest me. So I restrict the, the from clause here, and that's the, the whole trick. You can uh, have a, a more uh, more exact look later here when you get the DB. It's just, and it's not really difficult. And let me make a, a fifth one here. You can have more in. A few seconds. The most important thing is the line to the top. Can't live without it. So, and then it has to have a name with a number on it. Uh, it's not really readable again. So, and it has to be the number five because it's the fifth one here. And I think I need a fifth iteration here. And that's it. That should work. And we have. Yep, we have a fifth one here, so you can easily expand it. And also the rows work again for every version here. So that's the horizontal continuous form. And maybe this is sometimes useful if you don't have or, or if you don't want to use so much uh, vertical space in a form and want to show some data for, for the user in a more horizontal way. So it's an easy way to do this. So that was the horizontal continuous form. Next tip, number five, one of the problems when you work with several instances of the same subform is that sometimes you have to know in which instance you are. I had four and five instances here of the same subform, and sometimes you have to know it to react to it, to give a message or whatever. And Dirk Goldgar a few years ago delivered a solution for this. You can iterate to the parent controls, look for subforms, and then do this here, form property and is me. That's a test for rever reference equality. So this knows that you are really in this instance. And I'll show you an example here again. We use the same example. And if I double click on one of these, it says, hey, this was subform number one. If I double click on one of these here, it says subform three. And you always know where you are in. And that's really useful if you work with many instances of a subform. Know all the time where you are and how to react. So that's a quick tip for this uh, situation here. The decisive part is is and then me for reference equality. So this was number five. Let's come to number six. Usually, if you have a string variable, you can't distinct between there is no value assigned and there is an empty value assigned. So a double quote or a VB null string. And there is one method how you can distinct between this, and this is a string pointer function is it's retrieving the memory address. And I've linked discussion in Stack Overflow where they discuss the details. But I will briefly show you an example or two examples how to use it. First thing is I have a string variable here and I don't assign any value and ask string pointer for the return value null because this means nothing assigned. And if I start that one here, it says nothing assigned. If instead I would have assigned an empty string, it says empty string. So it can decide if it's not assigned or if it's empty, maybe not string. And the second use, practical use, could be an input box. Normally, you can't distinct between an input box if the user has canceled the input box or he, he clicked OK and didn't input any value. So if I start this one here, the input box, and I close it, it says you have canceled. If I start it again, and this time I click on cancel, it also I recognize that I canceled. And the third test is I don't put anything in and say, OK. And it knows that I said, OK. That may make a difference in the message you provide to the user. And you see what the mess, it's the st same thing. The stupid uh, function here again is checked against zero, and it knows what happened. So this is a practical use for that. Just a quick tip for this kind of variable. Next tip, I just want to give a shout out to this tool. I don't want to show it because it would be too complicated, but I use it all the time at clients for when to distribute front ends to many workstations or to directories on a terminal server, etc. I always use this old tool by Peter DeBates. We can have a quick look. 
it's an old one. It's an MDB, and you have to convert it to an ACCDB, but it works uh, also with 365, etc. And it's free. It's a free tool. I mean, everybody, or almost everybody has a tool or a file, etc., to distribute uh, front ends. But this one is really good. It's completely open. It's free. You can change the code. It's just a simple MDB or ACCDB. And it does the usual thing. It checks whether the, the destination folder exists or creates it. It checks for a new front end version on the basis of the file date, and it loads the front end into this destination folder. There's also an option that you can say, I want to replace my front end after a week, even if it's okay, or if there's no new version, it might have a bloat, it might be rotten or whatever. And you can say, every seven days I change it. You can make a backup of the back end if you put in a file name. You can compress the back end, lock out the users from the back end. And of course, you can start the front end and close the, the tool itself. So big shout out to this tool. I used it many times at clients and still use it. If you're still looking for a good method to distribute front ends, this is the thing to go in my point of view. Next one, um, sometimes you may have the task to decide uh, if a report was opened in page preview or in a report view or really sent to the printer. I mean, you don't see if it was really printed, but that the user sent it to the printer, tried to print it. There's no built-in method, of course, but there are different events that you can use for this. Let me show you an example. This is print preview, and if I open up the immediate window, you see that it already wrote preview here. And I close it. Let me show you the report here. It's this, the only one. If I open it up with a double click, it opens in the default view of a report view. And if I had a look, it already knows that I have it open on the screen. So it can distinct between the different uh, forms of opening it. And the, the third one would be if I press Control P to print it, and I print it as a PDF in this case, and it's a wonderful, wonderful PDF. And if we have, it knows that I printed it. So you can determine preview screen or printer and react with your code or whatever, what you show on the screen, how you handle your users. And the trick is this one here in the code. It's just a few lines of code. I declare a variable here on the module level. And then the decisive thing is the activate uh, event of the report. Activate only happens if you are in a screen view. And here you can ask, is it the preview? Then I set the variable. Or is it the report view? Then I say it's on the screen. And then I use the print event. This event happens all the time, whatever view you use. And so I can say if the Boolean value is set, I know it's in preview. If it is not set, it must be the printer. And yeah, that's it. And then I set it back here. So you have all the three things and that's the whole trick. You just have to know that activate only happens for screen views. Carl, yep. can that also distinguish between report view and layout view out of interest? Oh, I never use layout view. Interesting questions. Can't answer it. Would have to have a look. Okay, thank you. I will have a look afterwards. <laughs> Interesting <laughs> question. I hardly ever use it either. It just it occurred to me as uh, you were doing that. Yeah, usually you don't give the, the view to the user. That's the, the, the most important thing here to know what the user does. And layout view... Yeah, usually not for my users. That's why I never tried it. Yeah, let's come to the next tip here. Sometimes when you create a form and you create a controls, you set some uh, property for the controls, it would be a good thing to have a kind of set focus in design view, as I called it here, to do a run command, for example. Some Many of the commands of the properties you, you do for a control don't work in, in design view. If you don't have a selection of, a, uh, because there is no property, you, you can just code away. But there is a property that gives you a kind of set focus in design view, and this is called in selection. Let me show you an example. I open up a form in design view, and one of the elements, one of the controls is already marked here and, and chosen, and it's the first name. You see here, the TXT first name, and there's also one for the city, I'll show you how it did it. Oops, let me go to the code. It's a procedure I call. And if I change this first name here to, let's say, the city, 
And let me click my button again. Yeah, now the city. And now I could do some run command or whatever. How is this done? I'm gonna show you the code. So this is done by procedure here. And this one in selection, and I just pass it the form name and the control name as a string because it's usually not open. And then I assign it to some object variable. I say, take the form, take the, the control. And the first one is I deselect everything because maybe it's already open in design view. And the deselect already uses the in selection property. And I say, iterate through the form controls and set everything to false. Nothing is selected. And then I say, and then select the control I pass to you. Set it to true, and then I could do some run command or whatever I want to do with this control. And you also could do it for every control. If you loop through the controls of the form and you say in selection true, and then you do some run command like this, that only is available as run command, size to fit, size to grid. There are dozens of, of properties that are only available by run commands. And in the end, you say false and go to the next control. So that's some versions of, of this thing. And shout out to Anders Ebro, who provided this trick because he does a lot with this control layouts. He had to have them. <laughs> so this was a kind of set focus in design view. Next one, eval. Everybody knows eval and uses eval sometimes, but maybe you don't use it as I use it very often in, in queries. By the way, this, this one is taken from F1, from the, the help file uh, for eval. And it really contains interesting things. For example, you can, in VBA, use uh, SQL operators like between and or in, and they have an example here in, in the help file. And you, you could say eval some form control in the in operator and then some states in the US. So you can use between and in or other operators that usually only work in uh, SQL. But I want to show you the, my main point here is how to show it, uh, how to use it in queries. So I open up an example form, easy one. I show you the design view. It's just two unbound controls and I can choose from our list of names again. And I choose Adams here and I open up a query and it finds the record Adam. So, okay, that wasn't a wonderful trick, but you have to see it in design view. This is a combo box and it has two columns, two columns. The first one is the ID as you usually do it, the hidden column. And the second one is the text column. So you have to use the column property here. And there, I always see tricks like uh, hidden text fields that take the thing from the column and then you can use it in the query. You don't need this. It's enough to just use eval. If we go to the query again and have a look in the design view for the last name, I did this. I just said eval my form name column one. So you can have a direct reference, more or less direct reference through eval and a look at the columns of a list box or a combo box and use it here. Second example for, for the use of eval is, let's say I want to have a list of ID values here. Have a, let's say I want to have four values and I open up a query. Oh, there is nothing with a thousand something, uh, 900. <laughs> so I get the four values. How is this done? Again, with the use of eval, I do this here. I say, eval where the address id is in the in operator in what i deliver in my comma separated text field here so you can deliver several values you can also do it for text just need more more apostrophes here and double quotes but this is done for the id and you say if this is true then you're done and you get the values with a comma separated thing so eval really useful in my point of view also for this use here in queries that's eval let me come to tip number 11. Um, some properties that in my, in my experience are overlooked for, for years. For example, the fetch defaults. I mean, some of you would say, I know it for 20 years because it already exists for 20 years from XSXP on. But every now and then I see a discussion where people wanna, wanna hide their default values in the form. Let me show you a quick example. This is a form where we don't see any default value, but it comes from a table where we have two default values. I have one default value here for the quantity, that's just the one, and I have one for the delivery date here, that's the, the current date. So I have it in the table, I don't see it here, but if I 
activate the fetch default property, then I see it. If I try to deactivate again, it doesn't work because you only can activate it one time, then it's over, you're done. The property is killed more or less. Let me go to design view and show you the code. It's not really huge. I just toggle the fetch default here. And I, when I did a true, it worked. When I did the false, when I tried the false, it didn't work because you can only do it in the opening events. In current load and open, you can say fetch default is false. Otherwise, only one true works. So it's it's quite restricted, but usually you don't toggle this thing. It's It was just to test it out. And I also kind of documented it here. And other candidates in this category of overlooked properties. I mean, some of you will shake their head because you do it all the time. But if I, if a fellow colleague asks me to do some support, etc., I always see that they click away the, the, the next screen where they are asked if they want to do a macro or event procedure or expression, open up the expression service, because they didn't see the option for always use event procedures, or they didn't turn off the auto index on import create of a new table and always get an overhead of indexes in fields that contain ID and number, et cetera, in the field name. Other things are, for example, the block command in the VBA editor. Many people don't know it or the bookmarks. Let me show you a quick example what I do in this case. For example, normally they are in the in the edit command bar here. So you have it here for block command and the bookmarks. I usually put them into my standard command bar because I have it ready also if I don't have much uh, space. And what I did here is also assign a, a keyboard shortcut. We discussed it uh, two or three months ago in the blog of Mike Wolf. Uh, Colin was also present. And that you can do, uh, even if you normally can't build a shortcut here, I build a shortcut here. And what I did is I chose customize and then I just choose image and text. And I did an ampersand C and an ampersand X for lock it again and command it again. And so I can use, for example, here, I just press Alt X, Alt C, Alt X, Alt C. So it's it's very easy to use the, the keyboard here. Additional tip, this would be number 16. <laughs> uh, another overseen property in my experience is the control source for, for an image. It exists since years, since 2007, but people often, every time I see the picture property, they set the picture property to something, which isn't as versatile as a control source or the, the newer label name property of a control since access 2019. Okay, <laughs> I come back to this uh, things in a minute with the next tip. But these are some examples of properties I often see in discussions where people just don't know it. And the next tip is also about these kind of properties because every time Microsoft, the access team includes a new property, they don't always change the, the VBA object model because of backwards compatibility. They don't want to lose it with every new property. And the bad thing for this is you can't use just dot and property name to reference the property. So the trick is, for example, for the control source that I mentioned a minute ago, you can't do this here because it just doesn't exist as a property. This is the trick, how you can do the control source. You have to do properties and then put it in as a string. And the same goes for the layout, for the control layout. It isn't uh, built in as a property, but you can use it like this. And there are several other things you can do with uh, layouts like all these properties. And the same is also true for the label name since 2019. You can only access it and program it in, in your VBA code if you use a syntax like this. Let me show you a quick example. So this is the image, an image control, an empty image control. And I try to use it with dot property. And what I get is this. This will be the usual error message you get. Property or method not supported. And if I go to debug, you see what I tried. This was the crime. I tried to do it with a dot control source. This doesn't work because it's not there as a control so uh, as a property. What I have to do is this one. I have to use the longer syntax here with control source as a string, and then I can assign something. And that's the second button here. And I click the second button here, and here I am in my younger years. And the same works uh, with uh, for the control layout property. So if you have a look here, you see that it's a property, uh, it's a control layout for the first two here. 
And the third one, the third control is not in control layout. And if I click this button here, I get uh, these three values here. And they correspond to these three lines. I asked, is the first text in layout one, the first text box in a layout? If it's in the layout, you get two. The second one is in the layout. The third one is not in the layout. So you can prove against are they in the layout or not. And you have to use this kind of syntax again. Even if it doesn't exist as a real property in VBA, you can use it like this. And I'm sure there are several other properties built in the last 15 years that they didn't really build in as a property. But these are three examples where this kind of syntax helped. Next one. Oh, that's a nice one. I like that. <laughs> it's very old. We did it all already in the 90s, but many people still don't know it, that you can put some color in your list and combo boxes. Let me show you the example. This is a list box, and you can do exactly the same for a combo box. So you can highlight something with uh, colors, with having data or not, Etc. And how is this done? Well, you can do it uh, using the format property of tables and queries. And this format property propagates through to your list and combo boxes. So I could have done it directly in the table. I did it in the underlying query here. Let me open it up and you see that it looks exactly the same. And what did I do here to get this uh, result? If we change to the design view for the remuneration that I pay for uh, presenters at my conferences, I did this here. I said, if the remuneration is more than thousand euros or dollars, then they are expensive. And the important thing is this one here. I said, in the format property, you have uh, for text fields and memo fields, you have two options, uh, two parameters here. The first one is if a value exists, then I take it and color it red. If it doesn't exist, so the value is now, I write in cheap and make it green. So this is the result then. If it's more than 1000, I get it in red and expensive. It's less, it's green, uh, cheap. The second one is the rating here. If you have a look, if the rating is just one star, and this is, by the way, for Carl, that's not okay. So there is some kind of swearing here. And if the rating is good, five stars, then there is a heart. How, do it, how did I do? If there are, the rating is different, nothing is there. Just for one and five. And the trick is this one here. I said, if the rating is one, then give me this. If the rating is five, give me a heart. It's just another character of this font here. I even don't know what font, but you usually get hearts and other symbols in the font characters. And what I also got here and used here is if there is something in, again, the format property, I said red here. Yeah. Give me the, the character or the text and give it in red. And the last one is the country. I said in the format property again, give me the value if there is a value. If there is no value, write down missing and color it in magenta. And the result is this one here. Missing, missing, missing if there is nothing and in magenta. And the nice thing is propagates into your list boxes and into your combo boxes. So this is useful if you want to highlight something like the expensive people here, missing data, etc. Uh, there are some restrictions for this kind of trick. It's quite moody. It works most of the time, but not in all versions. But for example, it works in 365 again. And, and you have to know some caveats, like in this boxes, you have to include the primary key in the query. In combo boxes, you have to include a, an arbitrary setting in the format property, like the add sign. And it only works with text and memo fields, but that's not really a restriction because the result in a list box or in a combo box is a text anyway. And so in the query, you can use C string to change it to a text and then use the format property again. Uh, it only works in safe tables and saved queries. If you use SQL, it doesn't remember the, the formatting, so safe query. And of course, the colors are just the system colors. That's another restriction. But other than that, I find it quite useful. I have two more. Just a quick tip about context menus, because I already have seen real complete menu systems built on the context menu. I think they are underrated, what you can do with them. And usually, you can call a context menu with a show pop-up method, command bar show pop-up. 
doesn't work all the time, but you can also use a few lines of API code to get them. And one example I find it useful is when you don't have a lot of space, for example, this a report button, the user clicks on a report button and he never remembers the right mouse button. So I laid it, I, I did it for the left mouse button. When I click, this is the only thing a user can do, click with the left mouse button and the user gets print preview or print or PDF or whatever the output format of the, the report. I think it even works. Yeah, it even works, the print preview, for example. So left mouse button, that's the point here. And you get the context menu for other options. Or if you use it in the list box, you can click with the left again and you get a context menu. And here, what's behind that? In the button, I have a real menu that I built myself some years ago. That's why it is in German, it says print menu a small menu that I built here. And here I have nothing. So it's the, the, the system, the default context menu. And this also decided about the method I used because if I have a real shortcut menu bar set in, I can use show pop-up. When I try this with the built-ins, I get an error usually, and I have to, to use a few lines of API code. We got it by Jack Stockton from a discussion two years ago. So just two methods, it's even 64 bit ready. And essentially it calls the mouse event for the right down here. So you get with the left button or whatever method you want, you get the context menu. So quick example, how you can use context menus for other reasons than you usually would do if you don't have a lot of space, etc. And if you wanna maintain context menus, these are the two best links, the, the free editor by Dale Fye that many people here know. And there's also a more visual tool by Phil Stiefel's company, Access DevTools. You get the links here. The last one, generate QR codes. There's no built-in functionality as we all know for your QR codes and they are everywhere nowadays. There are several indirect ways. For example, you can and purchase an active X and add in DLLs, all kinds of tools exist. And there's also an add-in, a free add-in for Excel, but you have to automate Excel, then use the add-in, blah, 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 complicated thing. There are two free methods you can use for QR codes. One is by Daniel Pinot. He wrote an article some months ago and he uses JavaScript libraries. So if you click on this link, you can see all his methods and, and read his article. What I want to show you today is another method, a simple exe file done by the author Nir Sofa. He's an Israeli author and he's quite famous if you ask Windows administrators because <laughs> he does all the nice tools where people can do more than they should, but he's a real great programmer. <laughs> And I will show you the example here. Yeah, his tool has some advantages. It can be automated uh, with a command line. That's what I do here. And you can do commands, command lines like save me whatever I want in an image file with whatever scaling I want, etc. And you have several output formats. Uh, the default format is JPEG, but you can do every one of these. Let's have a quick look to this website, by the way. Yeah, it works. And this is the tool website where you can do the download. And you see there are a lot of options. You can even decide about the scaling, the image scaling, how many pixels do you want, et cetera, et cetera. You can read all this here, the error correction and whatever. So it's a quite versatile tool and I'll show you how it works. So this is a text box and I say, I wanna see how Colin looks Oops, as a QR code. Really Awful. Cool. This is Colin, one eye, two or three eyes, yeah. <laughs> nice look. And what I did in the background here, I called this simple code exe here, and I created this picture here, and then I linked it back to the picture um, with uh, the control source property, just uh, doing the date and, and time in. Or another example, the best website in the world, you won't know it, it's... This one, it would look like this, for example. Yeah? And again, what I did is call the exe and it created the second file here. And the code is really simple that you need. You just, yeah, by the way, it's a very small exe with a 65 kilobyte that you download here. If we go back, I'll show you the code that you need for this that is behind this button here. And it's a, okay, I, I have a variable and I assign it the current project path and do some formatting for the, the output file. JPEG, blah, blah. And the essential thing is this here. I do a shell for the current project bus. I call the simple code generator exe and the command is save. And I say save 
whatever I send you in my text file here and into the full pass and that's it. And the other thing is, again, I have to use this one because maybe you remember you can't do dot control source for an image. You have to use this syntax here and then I assign it to file and I write it also into a small text box down under here. So that's it. One minute before the time. I'm done. Carl, that was absolutely amazing. Please take a breath now. I think you've, <laughs> I don't know how you managed to keep talking for an hour, but that was very, very impressive. Right, Carl. Do you want to, I'm going to put you back on. Would you like to share your screen again, Carl? Uh, I'm done. I'm through. You get the HCCDP, and I hope that there was something useful for at least some of you. There were a lot of comments. I mean, you, right. Can I also say, Carl, you've got the, had the record for the number of people who've turned up for one of these sessions here. At the moment, there's 25, but there was more than that earlier. Um, so well done to you. Um, right, going back, there was... That, that was the advertising, you know, in the next session you get five people or so. <laughs> <laughs> going back to your, your random um, data generator at the beginning, I've used Mockaroo for years, which works in much the same way, and it works well, but what that, of course, does is create CSV files, whereas this is actually importing it straight into Access, which I think is wonderful. So I you, can, you can also create CSV files, you can even create SQL scripts with all the data if you use it for SQL Server, etc. Right, okay. Coming back to that question about chat GBT, apparently Richard Rost has done some data generator that way there. There were several people, there was a discussion about whether or not the postcodes that are generated should match or be realistic to the town and so on. I think you've, you could argue that both ways here. Coming back to your, your, I think, second or third tip about creating a property that doesn't work in an ACCDE file, does it? Was the question. I've gone blank. Hmm, good question. I don't think it works, but I would have to try. I never distribute ACCDE files. Again, it's, it's all open. I sell my code. That's why I don't have practical experience with this. Interesting question. Yeah. Okay. You can't create it, I think, but if it is pre-created, we, we would have to have a look. <laughs> I think it will not work, but we could try it. <laughs> okay. Right. The, a lot of people like the horizontal continuous form. I did because I tried to do the same thing a few years ago, but nowhere near as well as you've done that. So I shall steal that. I used it for a contacts database and it was, you know, the idea was great, but the implementation in your case is even better. So did I, did I mention that the ACCDB is about 200 pounds or so? <laughs> no, otherwise, you didn't. Otherwise I, you get a next screen. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm going to um, make this you mute at that point. I think Carl. <laughs> so, right. Only for you, Colin. Yeah. There was a long question about long discussion in the background about string pointer. I was going to ask about ver pointer as well. Um, does anyone want to come back to that? Go on. Just a, just a quick note on that. Philip Stiefel also did a video. He saw my presentation about the string pointer at the AK and he did a video about it. Maybe the, that answers also some questions. I will put in the link to the video also. Thank you, Carl. Right. Um, a lot of people like the color formatting. I gave a link yeah. um, and Chris Arnold gave a link as well to the Microsoft web page for that. I, I use that for putting a hint on blank text boxes and so on, saying like enter a forename and so on, a bit like they do on websites. And that works well there as well. Thought I'd kept up, but there was a lot at the end from people. All the other things you do, like playing the ukulele. I, I think people were hoping that was going to be number 17. But anyway. Uh, next time. Next time. Not not if you're going to ask $999 for a speaker fee. Right. I have to, I have to live. <laughs> you're no. right, surely. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to throw this open to other people now. We have still got 25 people here although one person was so keen they've actually joined twice any questions from other from other people anything people want to raise that was a brilliant session i'm out of breath trying to keep up with it i, I would comment that there's was a number of things in there that were um new to me or at least i hadn't used for a while I mean, some obviously some were new and i hadn't used at all before i wasn't aware of so i found that very valuable so thanks carl thanks adrian I I had this application where in accounts they go and enter batches of invoices and so they go in and put in 
the end of last month's invoices. So effectively what I did was I wanted a, a sticky date and I used the same thing as you did with that default prop. But what I did was basically whenever they set the value of the invoice date control, it sets the default value to the value they enter. So effectively it becomes a sticky date. And then when you do a new record, it defaults to the previous entry. So it allows you to effectively, while you're doing a batch entry, retain the date as a default and every time you change it, it keeps that as the default it's a little bit different because it's only working at runtime it's not saving it to the property of the design of the of, of the control so it, does, it would work in an act e it's just i just called it a sticky date but it was a very similar technique on that neil the, and it doesn't it, it only works for things like continuous forms you've mm. got the control quote button that gives you whatever was in the 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 previous yeah of that form yeah. which can give you could be very helpful for that but obviously the operator needs to to understand that rather than what you're doing is is the coding of it yeah well, this was a single form where you've got an yeah, invoice no, sure. and then you do a new record go to new record to go create the next invoice and they're doing batch entry so it's a useful technique shoving it into the default i wasn't i wasn't talking against that in as mm. much as mm. that's a great idea mm. just filling in you know sometimes that is already you know you've designed that in sometimes but it's helpful for people to know sometimes that if yeah. that hasn't been provided for them they can at least do that with the uh I see again the question if the accb is available it will be available in the next days or i'll send it to colin and he will post it somewhere wherever i yeah i'll just say on that i post things in two places one on the um access user group org website but that's only for people who are subscribers so there's also a page for each session on my own website uh, so there'll be a download to there and also a link to the YouTube video once that is available as well other points uh, you said you never you never distribute ACCDE you always do ACCDB that I used to do that as well we've got the exact opposite approach from somebody James Spellman who never distributes ACCDBs a lot of um, people do that yeah so I think, you know, there are, you can argue it both ways. I used to do this thing about uh, leave it open and allow them to, only with site licenses, allow them to make changes, but we'll see. You know, I get twice the money that he gets with selling the code. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually do both. I always give the client an ACCDB, but my own toolbox of library code i include as an accde so i'm not giving away the crown jewels every time yeah but, uh, i love this comment and who i think is from south africa has asked is it possible to replay youtube in slow motion and i had to think about why he was saying that and then i realized uh, that was the speed you were talking at carl so he's going to play you at half speed uh in order to keep up with it and it's it's and it's not even my language it must sound horrible i know what, what, are you, what are you like in your native language up there anyway so all right. uh, ask thomas he knows <laughs> anyway crystal has given a serious answer to that one uh whether i meant it seriously or not i don't know so right has anyone got any other questions for carl while we are fortunate enough to have him excuse me is the horizontal uh form thing there updatable yes it is okay right any other questions for carl no i think we would just all like to say thank you ever so much for stepping in and that was truly amazing and i think everyone here will have got things that they either had forgotten or never knew in my case both of those are true and i think there will be i think we could have carl back every month for a year if he would come and we would still have hundreds of new tips and tricks there as well and so. all the other board people already left china <laughs> it's all the same at my conference <laughs> and we've only lost one actually so right after that what can possibly follow well luckily we've got something equally but very differently good for next month and that is we have thomas muller from germany who is going to be doing a follow-up on charts and this was suggested i think it was by neil back in may when crystal did her session and thomas is going to be doing a very very different way of creating charts and access using javascript which i've tried out and it is absolutely stunning and thomas if you would like to speak to this in the meantime if people want to have a look i'll just leave this link on for a second and then i'll stop sharing again um but you can try out in advance if you wish to thomas over to you yeah 
Yeah. As you said before, next one, uh, next month, I will tell you uh, something about the charts, uh, and a new way, an alternative way how we, uh, we can create charts and access. The official title is State of the Art Charts in Access with Chart.js. And I worded my presentation a little bit more lur luridly. Better access charts, the real modern charts for access. And um, I think that is something you can look forward for. And um, I'm really happy to do this presentation next month. Should be very fun. Thank you, Thomas. Any questions for Thomas or any other questions for Carl? I wanted to comment um, just, just to, to, to comment on something I hadn't realized that Carl brought attention to with some of the properties that aren't aren't immediately visible i don't know what the direct where you have a dot property name i've come across those before but i never realized why some of them were and some of them weren't it always uh, that, I, that was a state of confusion for me so i'm very pleased to to have that update and i've known how to get around it but i never knew why it was there in the first place so that's that's very helpful thanks Carl. I think another problem is that they've introduced a lot of new properties and never got around to documenting them, even some that they have actually surfaced on the property sheet. Right. Even some options are not documented, some new options. We could uh, do a session about it. <laughs> I yeah. just saw a, a short discussion about um, uh, if the post postcodes uh, should match the city, etc. I think, yeah. yes, I showed a, a quick example with the product text file. So you can always put in real uh, postcodes and matching cities, uh, matching places into your test data. If you have to have matching data, you can put it in from external files. That's no problem. Right. In fact, the, what it generates itself is not real postcodes or even realist. Well, they're realistic. That's, that's the reason for it. It's yeah. absolutely anonymous. Okay, thanks all for attending, and I'll see you again next month for Thomas Muller.